Good evening, everybody. We are here live with our brother Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. We're hoping Jonathan will be able to join us here in a few minutes, but uh, we're going to get crack lacking. So for those of you that are watching, hit that good old share button. So I'm going to go and do that to uh, to Facebook because we are here. We're live on the actually, let me make sure that we're streaming over there to our Instagram page. I don't hear it. Oh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to hit that button and then it should uh, it's going to give me a little bit of a feedback loop, but that's OK. Cool. OK, now it's now we're on Instagram as well. Wow, it's amazing. So while I'm hitting the share, uh, Rod, introduce us, give us the. You know, whatever version you want to do, because we got we got time Um just tell folks who you are, and then I'm going to start asking questions of how you got into the whole apologetics thing in YouTube. But just kind of give us a brief test a, uh, <laughs> test a YouTube money. <laughs> well, I'm Rod Saunders. My pronouns are Jew and Greek. <laughs> That's the name of my blog and my YouTube channel, Jew and Greek. And uh, what I do is I cover theological issues and apologetics from a charismatic perspective uh, because so many of the apologetics and discernment sites and theology sites on YouTube and social media are produced by cessationists and non-charismatics. And so I thought it would be good to have our perspective represented on social media and so I talk about a lot of issues like speaking in tongues or healing and prosperity. Um, you know, the uh, I guess a lot of what we call uh, secondary theological issues. I guess also I cover some of the primary gospel issues because people have accused charismatics of not affirming the essentials. And so anyway, but yeah, I cover a lot of stuff like that. Every once in a while, I talk about uh, politics, not very often. And uh, I've even done a little music because that's I have a stronger background in music than I do in theology. But there's lots of people out there that play music. Not a lot of people were doing what I do as far as charismatic apologetics. Very true. Um Give us a short walk through your testimony, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty of uh, why it's necessary to have this perspective in the apologetic space because it's pretty much dominated by uh, only one tribe of the church, which is the Reformed. Uh, I mean, I don't even think Catholics do uh, apologetics, but kind of kind of walk us through your you, you were raised in a Baptist church, and kind of give us the point A to point B. So, how do you go from being Baptist? to charismatic guitar player, computer sciences, and then YouTube, <laughs> 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, well, uh, like you said, I grew up Baptist, about as mainstream as you could be in the 60s and early 70s in North Texas. I, w I went to First Baptist Church, and uh, I got saved and baptized when I was eight years old. I sang in the choir. I did uh, vacation Bible school in the summertime, Sunday school, training union. Wednesday nights, we had what we call royal ambassadors. And uh, I played on the softball team. I mean, I did all the stuff that a typical Baptist kid would do back then. But when I was well, just shy of my 17th birthday, I met some kids from an Assembly of God church. And by that point, I had my driver's license. You know, so I felt a little independence. So I thought, well, I'll just go to a different church. I'll try their church. I want to see what uh, other denominations are like. And, uh, of course, I didn't know anything about Pentecostal people. And this is back in 1973, 74, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. About 50 years ago. That's hard to believe now. But, yeah, it was about 50 years ago. And I walked in this Assembly of God church, and I heard people speaking in tongues and shouting and clapping and saying hallelujah. And I thought, what in the world have I gotten myself into here? Because <laughs> uh, I'd never seen any of this. Uh, but I decided to stick it out. Um, I stayed through the service. And uh, as the service was ending, I noticed everybody was kneeling. 
I thought only Catholics did that, you know. But these Pentecostal people, they were either kneeling at their pews or they were kneeling at the altar up at the front of the church. And so I had a hymnal. I was singing, you know. I thought that's what you did at the end of the service. You sing. So I'm singing, and I looked around, and I'm the only one standing. So I said, well, I'm out of here. And I put the hymnal down, and I left. <laughs> but the next day, one of the guys that uh, that I knew from that church, he was in the choir. He saw me. And he said, I saw you at church yesterday. And I went, oh, man, <laughs> I've been busted. And uh, he said, uh, why did you leave so early? I said, well, I wasn't feeling very comfortable there. Uh, there's some things about your church I don't understand. He says, well, what don't you understand? Maybe I can explain it to you. And I said, okay, well, first of all, uh, you say that you're Pentecostal. But then you say that you're assembly of God. So which are you? And he says, well, we're both. I said, you can't be both. That'd be like me being Baptist and Methodist. And he says, oh, okay. The name of our denomination is the assemblies of God. I said, fine. Why do you call yourselves Pentecostal? Boy, did I tee it up for him. I mean, he took me, <laughs> he had a little pocket New Testament that he took to school with him all the time. And he pulled it out and turned it to Acts chapter 2. And read it to me. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire settled upon each of them. They began speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I pretty much can say it from memory now, but back then I'd never heard of this. Hmm. And so I got to thinking, you know, I've been in church my whole life. I've never heard this. I wonder why. And then I thought about some of the verses that the pastor was quoting the Sunday before, and I'd never heard any of those verses. And it suddenly hit me that uh, there's stuff in the Bible that I've never heard. Mm. And either the Baptist church I went to didn't know about this stuff, which they should, or they knew about it and they weren't talking about it. And if they weren't, I wondered, why aren't they talking about this? So... Just my curiosity got the best of me, and I, I swore I'd never go back to that crazy church, but I went back. And uh, I kept going back, and before I knew it, I was one of them. And uh, so it's been a long road. That was 1974, and from then until now, I've gone through a number of other uh, discoveries, theological and so forth. And uh, I haven't been to an Assembly of God church in many, many years, but I go to charismatic churches because they're very, uh, very comparable doctrinally, uh, especially my stream, because I went to Kenneth Hagin's Bible school and he was an Assembly of God minister for years. But anyway, yeah, uh, <clears throat> the whole thing started because I wanted to learn to play the banjo and the banjo that I got belonged to a guy in that church because I'm a musician. I, I started on the piano when I was a kid and then I went to the guitar and then I went to the banjo. And then in my twenties, I picked up the fiddle mandolin and the bass. And uh, that's really what I focused on for years. I, I mean, I went to Bible school, but I never envisioned myself as a pastor or a missionary or evangelist or anything like that. I'm a musician. Yeah. So I just focused on the music for years and years. And then a few years ago, I noticed when YouTube came along that uh, there's so much stuff on YouTube that was just wrong hmm. about charismatics and word of faith people. And I said, why doesn't somebody set the record straight on this? And I thought, well, maybe they don't know how. Hmm. Maybe I need to. And so I started doing a lot of videos that presented our perspective on things. And eventually, uh, people started noticing the work that I was doing, and the channel started growing. So I got about 20,000 20, followers on Facebook, about 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. So it's not a big, big channel, but uh, I, it's probably a lot bigger than I ever envisioned it when I started. Huh, it's funny. So we've got a couple uh, here in the comments that Miss um, Vicki Adkins says uh, that your testimony is very similar to her. She came from the Presbyterian Church. And um, I can't remember. I, th I think this was a live stream that you and I talked about uh, our experiences in the Presbyterian Church post 
uh, being charismatics. You uh, you attended one. I think you said for two years or three years. Was it or was it longer? Oh me? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sorry. I was I was getting confused there. Um, a couple, yeah, two or three years back around ninety nine, because I remember. I had I had just started going to that church when we started talking about Y two K. Gotcha. Yeah. And then so I left about a hour, about a year. Well, I, I left after nine eleven, so I left in uh, probably two thousand two. About three years. Gotcha. And we just uh, we just got this connected to your channel, so we got folks coming in from Jew and Greek. <laughs> I help I help Rod with uh, some of his YouTube algorithm stuff, so he's. Uh, I was able to do that while you were talking. I was like, wait a minute, there's got to be a way because once I anyway. Um, but yeah, so Miss Vicky said that, you you know, she came from the Presbyterian Church and her testimony uh, similar. And Miss Janet uh, Rex wrote said uh, she didn't become one of them uh, till she moved to Florida and found Randy and Paula White. So that's interesting. That was a church without walls. Is that tur- is that church still in existence? I don't think so, right? I, ever could, since, ever I, I couldn't tell you. I, I I met them about the time that they got that thing off the ground. But they got divorced, and so I don't know whatever became of the church. Yeah, she married uh she married homeboy from Journey, so she, Slash. She married Slash. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> don't stop believing. Kane, I think Paul is it Paul Kane. Uh uh, my, uh, John, Jonathan? No, that's Jonathan Kahn. Oh, it's something. I'll, I'll I'll look it up. Presbyterian to Baptist to Assembly of God. What a road! Yeah. Well, I think he was. I think you went Baptist to to um uh to Pentecostal to the Presbyterian Church. So, um, talk a little bit about um because you actually got to study under Kenneth Hagen himself, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, because this is actually something I don't I don't think and I've watched. I've seen nearly every one of your videos on your channel, and I'd say at least a third of them I've watched more than once. Um, I am really blessed by by your ministry, bro. Um, If you had a Sunday school class, I would be that guy that was like in your class so much after three years, you'd be like, "Uh, Gabe, we're going to teach this. You can teach this because you've you've I know, you know, this backwards. So I'm going to be on vacation and you can handle Sunday school this uh, this 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 weekend. Uh, Hmm. Share a little bit about that experience, because you're able to discuss this issue of word of faith because you studied with with this guy that k- kind of coined mm-hmm. this phrase i mean with him personally so t- tell us a little bit about that what was it like studying under mm-hmm. kenneth hagan and what you learned about the word of faith well first of all i have to go back to my assembly of god days my assembly of god pastor knew kenneth hagan they were both assembly of god ministers in north texas back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when nobody knew kenneth hagan but Brother Hagen held meetings in Brother Alcorn's church a few times. Uh, he also knew Gordon Lindsay, who founded Christ for the Nations there in Dallas. Mm. And uh, my the, the pastor's son, Jerry Alcorn, went to Bible school with Kenneth Hagen's son, Ken Hagen Jr., there in Waxahachie, Texas. So uh, it's more than just being under Brother Hagen's ministry. I, I knew people from that world. The Assemblies of God in North Texas that Kenneth Hagin was from. And I started reading Kenneth Hagin's books while I was going to that Assembly of God church, which is why I ended up eventually going to Bible school there up in up here in Tulsa. So um yeah, it was uh it was a, a really uh powerful experience because for one thing, um the first thing that happened when we got to Bible school was we watched a video presentation that had been recorded there a couple of years earlier by Fred Price Mm. called Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption. Wow. This was kind of during orientation. They wanted to introduce us to uh, the the essentials of faith. And uh, his series, Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption, uh, separated the foolishness that many people were into from the biblical teaching on faith. 
you had people saying things like, uh, well, I cast the calories out of my food in the name of Jesus. <laughs> And, you know, yo, Fred yo, Price, listen, listen, I, I claim that in Jesus name. <laughs> Fred Price said, that's foolishness. You can't do that. You can't cast the calories out of your food. You want to lose weight? Go exercise and eat, eat right. <laughs> right. Use a little discipline. Other people would, uh, would, uh, married people. Now we're not talking about unmarried people, but married people would, uh, forego birth control and then just confess that she's not going to get pregnant. And Fred Price says, you know, that's foolishness. You know, the Bible says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if you sow human seed, you're going to root. <laughs> you're going to reap human humans. <laughs> right. So a lot of the foolishness that people get into, I avoided because I went through Rama and they set us straight on all those things. People got into extremism on confession. They were just going around confessing this, confessing that. And uh, listening to Brother Hagen teach on it, you realize that when you confess something, <clears throat> it has to be something that you've already got a revelation of it in your spirit. You, you've, you've, get, you've been in the Word. It's come alive to you. You've meditated on it. You've been in prayer about it. And you've built up a personal word in your spirit about this thing. And uh, he said a lot of times he won't pray about something or... Uh, or confess something until he's meditated on it for a while and gotten it deep down into his spirit. So he's got the revelation of it mm. and you don't just go around. Well, I confess, I, I confess a new car. I confess a million dollars. I confess I'm going to win the lottery. I can, you know, people got a little bit crazy with stuff like that. And of course, just like, like today <laughs> and then nothing happens. And then they say, well, that stuff doesn't work. <laughs> it's because you were not, uh, mature about it you were just going around confessing a bunch of stuff instead of really trying to have a relationship with god where these things could be you know uh birthed in your in your spirit but he also got into things like um longevity um he said you know every once in a while he says i've been around a long time every once in a while somebody comes along and says that christians don't have to die and we can just live forever and I hear some people that learn the faith message, and they're going to run. Gonna, they're going to go around confessing that they're never going to die. Didn't didn't you just do a, a video the other day of somebody saying that the Apostle John's still alive, or somebody? Yeah, yeah, that was like last week. <laughs> yeah, um, within the last couple of weeks, yeah, I did that video, but that's different, you know. I mean, we do have a, a, a biblical narrative there about whether or not John was going to die. But the Bible says it's appointed a man once dying after that judgment. And so a lot of people say, well, yeah, so that means everybody has to die once. But then what about the people who are alive when Jesus returns? Mm. You know, the Bible says, Paul says, behold, we shall not all sleep, yep. but we will be changed. Yep. And by changed, he means dead. That's what it means in the Greek. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no, no. I'm being I'm being facetious. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, we got to have an answer for everything because, you know, if we don't if we can't explain it, then, you know, we just we just write it off or, oh, it's just a bunch of malarkey. It's just a bunch of lies. So I was going to do the Jan Crouch thing. I was going to go, hmm, I've never heard that before, <laughs> which is my way of saying I call BS on that. Oh, anyway. oh I, I got a better one for you. Here we go. Right here. That's not how the force works. There we go. That's good old <laughs> Han Solo giving us something from the, tri the from the from the trilogy we don't speak about. Yeah. Uh, but they got into things like uh, medicine. Uh, I remember Ken Hagen Jr. one day stood up in front of the whole student body and he read an article at the, in the newspaper about this uh, hyper charismatic group group up in Indiana. I think it was Indiana. Uh, you ever heard of Hobart Freeman? No, sir. Okay, Hobart Freeman was a well. He had a like a master's or doctorate in theology, but then he became Pentecostal, charismatic. Hmm. And he started teaching that uh, doctors and medicine were wrong. Oh, boy. And that you just need to trust God. And people in his church were dying of stuff they could have been treated of. And so they came under investigation for like, I don't know, a dozen different cases of uh, manslaughter 
and he ended up dying from something he could have been treated for. Wow. And so Ken Hagen Jr. read that article. He says, this is the kind of stuff that we need to avoid. And he said, if anybody here denies their kids medicine when they need it, you're going to be expelled from the school. He says, now, if you want us to pray with you, fine. We'll pray with you and, and we'll minister to you as you seek healing for your kids. But don't deny your kids or anybody in your family medicine. We're not against doctors in medicine. Mm. We're for healing. Yeah. But we're not against doctors. So he addressed that error because some people would accuse all word of faith people of denouncing doctors in medicine. Yeah. Being it's crazy. A lot of... <laughs> Yeah, just a lot of really practical, balanced stuff when it came to prosperity. Brother Hagen said, you know, I know a lot of people say they're going to live by faith and don't, they don't work. He said, I've always worked, mm. and you're no better than me. Yeah, He said, I, I pulled up tree stumps for a living when I was a teenager. When I was the pastor, I pastored a small country church, and I had to do everything. I mowed the lawn, I painted the place, I swept the floors, I cleaned the toilets, and he said, I did everything, carpenter work, electrical work, plumbing work, you name it, I've done it. And he says, I've always worked. God doesn't bless you because you're just living by faith and not working. God blesses the work of your hands. Yep. And that's in you Proverbs several times. Mm -hmm. That's the, and, and people needed to hear that because there were a lot of people who said, you know, I'm just living by faith mm. and they weren't doing anything. <laughs> And yeah, that's when you need to take them to James and be like, well, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Right. So anyway, it, it was a real good time. The, the thing that I did not like about Rhema, and I was young and kind of immature then. This was 40 years ago. Um, I didn't like the the dress code. Mm. Um, and it wasn't so much the, the, the dress code. It was the hair code because <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have your hair down over your collar. And I was a musician, you know, I've always worn my hair down over my collar. But I I kept it short enough to get me through those two years. And then I remember as soon as I graduated, I said, I'm going to grow my hair down to my knees. <laughs> Which I didn't, but I did grow it out after I graduated. And then I, I moved to Nashville and I tried to get into the contemporary Christian music business for a couple of years. And I had the, what they call the dirty look, you know, where I kind of, kind of had a perm that came down and then about a week's growth on my face. I look kind of cool, but go for that I'll Keith, go for that Keith green. Well, Keith green had a little bushier beard than I had. I had the dirty look, the kind of very short trim on the beard, mm. but the, the but the per now his, his hair was naturally that way. But mine wasn't. I had, I had to have a perm. <laughs> and, and people see that photo and they'll say, oh, the, you, you had a, what do they call that? A, um, starts with an M. What is it? The mullet. Oh, oh, you had a Jesus so, mullet. You had a mullet. I said, it's not a mullet. A mullet is short in front and long in back. My hair was long all over. <laughs> but it was just kind of brushed back. Don't and break he, my heart. <laughs> Yeah, my aka breaky heart. Well, so let um, I want to get a little bit into the word of faith, and then I want to get into some of the uh, some of the battles that uh, that that you've had. Um, Rod with a perm, <laughs> that's um, flame flame from your channel. He's uh, shocked and awed. Um, so explain explain to us this where 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 we have and exactly like in you're you're kind of touching on it you know people think they they get into word of faith and they just throw the scripture it seems to those not in or familiar really with the movement they just like the well they just throw out the bible and just believe anything you know it's that mm -hmm. name it claim it blab it and grab it um and it's funny i was actually having a discussion with uh someone at the church the other day and discussing healing and even my own testimony and and they were like, well, that's that that's that word of faith. And I don't I'm like, no, no, I'm not talking about word of faith. That's what the Bible says. So kind of can you walk us through where why why is there this distinction between because you know it's it's kind of like the, the reformers, you know, there are a lot of people in the reformed church are no, we just preach the Bible. It's not reformed theology, it's the Bible. That's mm -hmm. what we teach. And right. honestly, those that, that believe in the word of faith say the same thing. So 
kind of hit mm-hmm. on what's what's the issues what is the, what are the people what are the issues that people have with it and why should there be common ground in because it is founded on completely on scriptural you know doctrine right yeah um a lot of people who are opposed to word of faith kind of run away from some of these proof texts like um Mark, Mark 11, 11, 23 and 24. Yep. Right. Jesus said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I learned it in the King James, all right? So I put the vows in it. Yes, it sounds better. But shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Yeah. So you ask them, all right, if that doesn't mean what it seems to mean, then tell me what it does mean. And they'll say, well, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe he's talking about Israel or, you know, maybe the mountain represents, you know, Israel or the, or the, the, you know, when Mike Winger taught on this, he brought up the Talmud and the temple and the mountain represents this. And oh that. yeah. That's like when they're talking about, uh, that was actually interesting. That was something I learned that they, that they believed that they when he cursed the fig tree, the fig tree, he's like, well, that was, he was, he was killing Israel then and replacing it with the church. And I'm like, what are you i was like what i I thought you guys don't eisegete that is the biggest (laughs) that would be your uh replacement theology oh big time which a lot of covenant theology people would would buy oh yeah oh yeah replacement theology but dispensationalists don't so i don't know how a dispensationalist would explain that passage but even if you do believe that there's some symbolism for israel there in another passage he says, if you say to this sycamine tree or mulberry tree to be uprooted and cast in the sea, it would obey you. So it's it's basically the same teaching. Only yeah. one says mountain. The other one says a tree. So to me, it's not about the mountain and the tree and symbolism. It's about the power of faith-filled words. Amen. But they don't want to acknowledge that, you know, so they have to come up with some figurative interpretation that sounds plausible. Mm. Um, James said that you can control the direction a ship goes with a tiny rudder. Yes. You can control the direction a horse goes with a bit in the horse's mouth. Yep. And he's talking about the tongue. Yes, he is. (laughs) Uh, uh, Then, you know, I mean, it's all through the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us hold uh, fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Um, the um, and then the, the the topics, the main topics, I guess, in Word of Faith teaching are physical healing and the atonement. Yes, that we believe it's God's will to heal because He provided healing in the atonement, and that's Isaiah fifty three four and five. Surely He has borne our pains and carried our sicknesses, yet we did esteem Him stricken of God, smitten and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions; He was bruised, bruised for our iniquities. iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes, we and are healed. That's right. And 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 in Second Peter, First Peter, it says, by his stripes we were. We so were. it's like it's done. And I it always blows me away that they talk about that in Isaiah, but they don't go mm-hmm. to that in like no no. He said Peter, the first Pope, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> the one that he rebuilt, you know, he said it's like no no no, it's done. It's it's paid for, and I'm like, I, I, it's uh, well, no, it's talking about spiritual healing. That when when we're in heaven, we're not going to be in wheelchairs. I'm like, are you <laughs> y'all are crazy, y'all are crazy. Oh, Nick well, Goss if, is here. What's up, Nick? If it was just talking about uh, healing in in heaven, if it was just talking about spiritual healing, then why would Matthew quote it when Jesus healed people who were physically sick? It's in Matthew chapter 8. They brought the sick to Jesus in Capernaum, and he healed them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Surely he's borne our pains and carried our sicknesses. Yeah. So according to Matthew, the context of Isaiah at least includes physical healing. So that's one component. Another is that we believe that financial prosperity is God's will. And this is where people get the idea of the prosperity gospel. Um, but prosperity is all through the Bible. It was part of the covenant that God made with Israel. Yeah. He told them, if you keep the covenant, you'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the basket, blessed in the store. Um, <clears throat> Psalm 1, David said, uh, 
Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. I'm not going to quote the whole song. Oh, but yes, he, he, yes, Proverb. Uh, yeah, Psalms, Psalms 1 through 5. Yeah, everything that he, he does. Said, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. prosper. Yes. The yeah. Psalm... And that's not just talking about financial prosperity. He's just talking about success. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Nick says, Proverbs says that the righteous man is rewarded in this life as the wicked is punished in this life. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm no. waiting. I'm waiting for some politicians to get punished, but wait, we ain't here to talk about that tonight. That's another. That's going to be another live stream. <laughs> yeah, I think the problem is, and I've had over forty years now to reflect on all of this. Uh, a lot of people don't have uh, a foundation uh, in in really balanced teaching like I have because they didn't go to Rama. Mm. And they didn't learn from Kenneth Hagin. They read a few Kenneth Hagin's books, and then they kind of went running off into error and extremism. And a lot of those people were on TV. Yeah. And so this is what most people see is the televangelist with their extremist version. Uh, call now for your miracle while the anointing for your miracle is here. And we will mail you this handkerchief just like Paul did, and you're going to, yeah. Yeah, and we do accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express. <laughs> yeah, put it on your and credit card. Get in debt right. for your miracle. <laughs> well, I, and, and, and I will say, I will say though, uh, in 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 their defense, or not even not even in their defense, in in God's graciousness and mercy, and Nick 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 is gonna look at me and be like, ugh, he's gonna be like, are you serious, Gabe? I'm I'm gonna share a, a testimony that. Uh... <laughs> so. I had no idea who Mike Murdoch was. No idea. I had just left Nashville short, uh, shortly left, left Nashville um, from you know what was a a soon to be booming music career. You know, I was meeting, I was doing sessions with Sony, meeting with Nineteen Management for writing stuff for American Idol, and got a call to go back to full time music ministry and felt the Holy Spirit was in it, and I just followed the Lord. And uh, was turned on Christian TV one day, and you know I'm not one of these anti Benny Hinn. I'm not a Benny Hinn fanboy. Uh, I'm I'm a balanced view. And turn on Christian TV, and there's Benny Hinn with Mike Murdoch, and they're t they're doing that thousand dollar seed. I'd never heard that. I'd never heard that before in my life. Mm -hmm. And buddy, I I sowed a thousand bucks that I did not have. And within a year, I got a contract to do some music with a with a company that yielded that times well over ten times. So, you know, I'm not saying you should, you know, because I Miss Janet said in the comments, you know, they they love to interpret scriptures for their gain to line their pockets. Yeah, some some of these jokers are out here for money. Some of these some of these people have fallen by the wayside and gotten in trouble. But I'll tell you what, the Lord rewarded my faith. So. You know, I'm not saying don't knock it till you try it. I'm saying be led of the Holy Spirit. But uh, Rod's looking at me a whole different. He's like, oh, Gabe. Oh, Gabe. Really, Mike Murdoch? Well, here's the, here's the problem. <laughs> you, you know, you, you go on TV. Robert Tilton figured this out. Oh, back in boy. The early 80s, that he was the first one that came up with the $1,000 vow thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a big audience. I mean, this is before the, the internet. Uh, and uh, so... A lot of people watched Robert Hilton in his Daystar program. Before there was Daystar Network, there was the program Daystar that was hosted by Robert Hilton and Word of Faith World Outreach Center in Farmers Branch, Texas. But um, <clears throat> he uh, knew that if there's 50,000 people watching and he says, uh, hey, you know, send $1,000 in and you're going to get your miracle. Yeah. And let's just say that uh, half of 1% of those 50,000, let's see, 1% would be uh, 500, and half of those would that'd be 250. If you got half of 1% to send $1,000 in, that's 250 people sending in $1,000. That's $250,000. That's a quarter, mi quarter million bucks. And in the 80s, that was real money. In yeah. the 70s and 80s, and that was real money. Now, out of the 50 people how many of them are going to have some sort of a financial windfall unexpected maybe five percent was five percent of 250 well let's see ten percent would be 25 so that'd be 12 
Mm-hmm. So you get 12 people that have a breakthrough, a miracle financially. Yeah. And then they contact Bob Tilston and say, Brother Bob, I just had to tell you, I sent you a thousand dollars. And, you know, I got a check from my ex husband for $150,000 or whatever. You know, some yeah. story about how they had this unexpected windfall of money after they saw it that made their thousand dollar vow. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's those people. But what about the majority, the vast majority that nothing happened? It's a numbers game. And, uh, I, you know, I thank God for your your uh, career breakthrough there, whatever happened. But uh, I don't know whether or not that had anything to do with Mike Murdoch. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. We don't give the glory to 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 Mike Murdoch at all. <laughs> <laughs> or sewing into Mike Murdoch. I think if you'd given that money to Billy Graham, or I don't know how long ago it was. Was it before Billy Graham retired? Uh, before he passed. Um, no, it was actually it was actually in the Benny Hinn's ministry because I still get stuff from I still get stuff from them. Okay. And you know, and honestly, I didn't feel. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not a I'm not gullible uh, generally, but I I had seen testimonies i mean growing up in central florida and having friends that worked and and i'll tell you i'll tell i'll say this testimony because it bears repeating um especially if those that are watching have never heard it there's a, a friend of mine who was very introverted i mean if th- this guy went to uh hey ian brown sold a ten dollar seed i don't know if it was into your channel or mine but uh he's uh, he's sowing seed to activate the super debt breaking anointing in his life hallelujah <laughs> Um, oh boy. Well, Janet, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a, a Jesse DePlanis story too. Uh, but boy, they go, they going after all of them now. Uh, and anyway, so this guy, he did sound at the church. He was not charismatic at all. I mean, like the only reason that she knew the guy was saved because he showed up to church because he was just unexpressive. You know, I think in the whole time I knew him, he said maybe a hundred words, not including this, te- like not including this testimony. So he worked for the sound company that got hired, or this video company that got hired to go to Africa to work one of Benny Hinn's. Uh, uh, no, they don't call it campaigns. What do you call his things? What Crusade. Do you Crusades. Yeah, and this is like when he came and t- when he told me the story, and like mind you, this guy never says anything. I was like, wow, this is incredible. So, you know, they're going out there with warlords and they got to have security with AK-47s. You know, they're going out there in the sticks. Something well over 100,000 people are there. And not everybody in this video company, this is not a Christian video company. This is just a video company with some, I think the owner was a Christian, but the people that work for it were not all Christians, not all believers. He testified that at this thing for Benny Hinn, that there were unsaved men manning the cameras that were falling out in the spirit. Now, I don't know what you do with that. I'm just saying that is what this man witnessed for himself, that these guys were falling out under the power of the Holy Ghost there in the middle of Africa. And they were, I mean, they had no reason to fake it. These were not believers. So, uh, you know, put that, uh, (laughs) just, you just put that away. So after, after reading his book, The Anointing, Hearing testimonies like that, I'm like, listen, I know the guy ain't perfect. I know people say what. And this is even before I had a better understanding of what biblical prosperity was. Because before then, you know, I agreed with most everybody that all these televangelists, all, you know, but I didn't see Benny Hinn as a televangelist. Just because he was on TV, I didn't see him as that. So that's, uh, take that for what it's worth, my friends. Well, brother, I'm happy you got your miracle. <laughs> Well, we don't we want, we don't want to spend too much time on uh, on on prosperity. Um, but I, I will say I think it's interesting that and uh, and Janet was testifying, you know, about uh, you know the 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 amount of, of of money that she's sown, and I didn't see the the back half of that. Miss Miss Janet, she said, you know, yeah, she said she gave tons of money. It was from her heart, and uh, and the Lord saw that. Uh, 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 and then she said the thing about Jesse Duplana. So I'm wondering, Miss Janet, um, if you feel like the Lord. Like you received a blessing from that, because I don't. I don't think that stuff goes unnoticed. Um, whether or not you received the blessing in the way you thought you were going to get it, um, 
I mean, and I know that just for myself, honestly, I think oftentimes I'll sow and I'll forget. And I think that's why I don't receive because I, 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 I forget. But the Lord remembers. So even then, I mean, here I am healthy, alive, cancer free, 20 years after the fact, 20 plus years after the fact. And, you know, I got a wonderful wife. Yeah, you did, but not financially. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. I hear you there. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to, boy, I'd love to, to see if I could get Bishop Allen in here to, to talk about, uh, finances. I got to find somebody that's, that's not so busy. That's, uh, that can really preach that. Cause, um, that fish come first thing changed my life. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you and apologetics. So why do you think the charismatic Pentecostal word of faith believers, you know, strand tribe is so lacking in biblical apologetics or theology or doctrine, just understanding of these things in, especially in today's age where you have so many skeptics, you have the Richard Dawkins. I mean, there was a time when you had uh, these four prominent atheists calling themselves the four horsemen, Christopher Hitchens, um, Richard Dawkins. Krauss. Yeah. Uh, what's his face? The guy that was uh, got blasted by Ben Affleck on Bill Maher's program for talking about Islam being Islam. Um, oh, that was the the guy with the big ears. Yeah, I can't stand that guy. But it, Her- is it Harris? Sam yeah, Harris? Sam Harris. Yeah. Of course, it was funny in that instance. I was like, well, I kind of agree with everything he said there. So, um, yeah. So anyway, wh- why do you think? Yep, Ian Brown was on it. Ian Brown was right on it. Sam Harris. And we, we, I should have brought you in on this. Uh, so why is that? Why do you think, I mean, we go to church more than anybody. <laughs> we go to church more than, more than the reformed, uh, more than mm. Catholics. I mean, ca- most Catholics go to church like, you know, a couple times a year. Uh, and here we are Pentecostals. We in church, man, every five seconds and yet, and can quote scripture, but can't explain to you. What is baptism and why does it, why do we get baptized? Well, the Bible says so. Yeah, but why, what does it do? You know, what, what's, Mm -hmm. you know, insert doctrine, insert theology. Uh, If you go back and study the whole history of Pentecostalism, you'll find that um, it came out of the holiness tradition. And the holiness tradition goes back to people like John and Charles Wesley um and it this okay you had the reformation what 600 years ago yeah something like that yeah Yeah, i guess it was 1511 wasn't it yeah anyway um you had the reformation and these catholic priests were leaving the catholic church and teaching justification by faith and pretty much for a couple of hundred years um People were teaching faith, yeah, not not word of faith, but just justification by faith, and not by keeping the decrees of the Catholic Church and the Pope and everything. And uh, Martin Luther actually said one time, "If I commit murder a thousand times a day, uh, as long as I have faith, you know, I'm saved." They had this view of faith that was a little extreme that. All you had to do was have faith. And Martin Luther had a problem with the book of James, which says, show me your faith apart from your works, not by my works will show you my faith. Yeah, it sounded a little bit too much like what the Catholics believe, like you got to work for your salvation. Luther didn't like that. Yeah. So there was a tendency for people, once they left the Catholic Church, to get off into extreme uh, in, in the area of faith and grace and leave aside the need for holiness. And that gave birth to the holiness movement. As people started reading the Bible, they saw all these verses about holiness and sanctification. And they said, you know, we haven't really been emphasizing that. So there was a, and and the guys that were leading the Reformation, these guys were scholarly. I mean, read some of the stuff that Calvin wrote in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. And he dove into all of these issues like the atonement, justification, and uh, imputed righteousness, and um, anyway, so you had all this theology from these guys, and then a couple hundred years later, you had people who said, you know, you guys are spending all your time 
focused on theology and, uh, you know, getting in and just dissecting everything to the nth degree, and you're not out there preaching the gospel. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't do the world any good if we don't get out there and preach the gospel to them and just sit in our ivory theological towers trying to debate infralapsarianism versus superlapsarianism. Yeah. So they got out and they started holding outdoor meetings and preaching the gospel. Whitfield and uh, see Jonathan Edwards and, and uh, John Wesley. And so the the holiness movement, I'm not saying that that Whitfield and, and Jonathan Edwards didn't care anything about theology, but there kind of became came this schism between the theology crowd that was really into justification by faith and the non-scholarly crowd that was preaching holiness, sanctification, and the Great Commission. Yeah. And so the people that were really out there pounding the pavement, preaching to the common man, tended to be the people that didn't have a background in all kinds of theology. Mm -hmm. But they had the, the passion, the fire to get out there and preach and win the world to Jesus. And then the you know, the uh, the reformed crowd tended to you know preach only in churches after getting their seminary degree. So you're saying things really haven't changed much in. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> history repeats it, itself. It, it, it's not a modern phenomenon. It, it has its roots in where these two camps came from. Mm. Then the, the holiness movement eventually led into the Pentecostal movement. The guys who started the Pentecostal movement were holiness preachers. Charles yes. Fox Parham, William Seymour. The Church of God in Christ was a holiness denomination before the Pentecostal movement. Yeah. And they just absorbed Pentecostal theology into their holiness theology. Yeah. So the roots of Pentecostalism are in holiness. And they tend to be people who don't study theology to the nth degree, but they get enough theology to where they can get out there and and win the world and and pray for the sick, cast out devils, and do whatever. Mm. Um, but I, you know, if you've watched my videos for any length of time, you know that I've emphasized that we need both. We need a an emphasis on good theology. Yes, we need to know the Bible. But yes. we also need a passion to get out there and reach the world. We don't need to sit around debating theology all day long when there's people out there who've never heard the name of Jesus. Yes. So we can do both. You know, we can have theology and, you know, a move of the Spirit and, you know, have a, a, a very fruitful evangelistic effort. Uh, most of the people who are coming to faith around the world are being reached by Pentecostals and Charismatics. And, you know, our theological opponents may not want to hear that, but, you know, just... It's the truth. Read, read the statistics from yes. Fuller Theological Seminary. They teach on missiology and church growth, and the numbers are there. You know, you may not see it so much in the United States, but you go, like, uh, Chris Harrison, my friend in Thailand, he's a missionary in Thailand. He 1040 said, window, hardly, yeah. He said, you hardly find... Uh, Christians over here that aren't charismatic. Yeah. Um, and uh, aim my, 1040, aim 1040. That's, that's his, aim, his ministry. Yeah. The Tim, the 1040 window. I yep. don't know how it's broken down, but the idea is that most of the unreached people in the world are in that window. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and then you have uh, Scott camp, my Baptist friend who grew up in my hometown. I never met him until two years ago, but we grew up in the same city. And uh, he got saved and went off to seminary and was actually he got a doctorate. And he was the dean at the Chriswell Bible Institute in Dallas. Now, Dr. Chriswell was like, you know, he was like Billy Graham. He was right up there with the upper echelon uh, in the Southern Baptist denomination. And Scott was the dean at his seminary. And then he started speaking in tongues. <laughs> and he lost his job. They kicked him out. <laughs> you, today, you interviewed him, right? Didn't you interview him on your on your channel? Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll interview him again. He's a great guy. But he's a missionary in Ghana now. I mean, he 
he's in the United States right now, but he's going back to Ghana. That's where he feels his calling is. But he told me, you get over there into Africa, you need the power of the Holy Spirit because you're you're dealing with people that have a background in voodoo. Witchcraft, and, real witchcraft. Oh, yeah. I mean, real demonic manifestations, people that will put curses on you and not like, you know, they're not right. playing around. These are real demonic manifestations that these people walk in real demonic power. Yeah. Yeah. And so he said, uh, you, you better the power of the Holy Spirit. You better know how to pray in the spirit when you get over here. So um, that's just the reality. The evangelism, the evangelism is being done primarily by people who speak in tongues. Yeah. And uh, and then what happens is, and I'll get criticism for saying this, but it's been my observation that everywhere the charismatics go and evangelize, the reformed people follow, and they convert the converted to Calvinism. Proselytize. You're getting bad theology from these charismatics. You know, you need to come to a reformed church where you can get sound doctrine. Come to a higher level. Come to the MBA. We're the we're the pros at, at this. They're all over the world. In South Korea, a man contacted me. He read my book. And he said, you need to get your book translated into Korean because there's a lot of reformed churches over here in South Korea that are pulling people out of the charismatic churches. So it's everywhere. It's it's South America, Africa. They don't have a whole lot of uh, fruit in Africa because those people don't uh, they don't really have a a, a good foundation of theology anyway, mm. and uh, they're they're just more likely to go charismatic because of their background in superstition and everything and supernatural. They definitely believe in the supernatural in Africa because they've seen it. Only it's not necessarily of God. They yeah, they experience the other side, big right. time. But the, but you, you know you get over there into uh, places like um, South Korea. I don't know about Vietnam and Cambodia and some of those other places. Uh, I don't think there's a a large Christian community. No, in it's, those other it's, countries. It's more it's more Buddhist, uh, Taoist, yeah. um, Islam. Is getting a strong stronghold, uh, a strong stronghold. They 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 they're really growing in Southeast Asia, but you know mm-hmm. it's because there's such a void. You know, Buddhism. Yeah. Well, just... South Korea was Buddhist before Billy Graham went there back in the fifties, mm-hmm. and he held his crusades there, and a lot of people came to Christ, and one of them was Doctor Cho. Yep, from who, the Rock Church, who founded the Yoido Full Gospel Fellowship, an Assembly of God Church in South Korea, and became the largest church in, in the, the world. world. Million people. Yeah, and uh, in the 1970s, my uh, my former pastor, um, well, one of my former pastors, had been over there to South Korea. He knew Doctor Cho, and he'd spoken at his church. And he he'd been to Prayer Mountain where they go. They, oh yes, you talk about this twenty four hour prayer network in Kansas City. They had twenty four hour prayer back in the seventies in South Korea. Well, I thought was uh, was incredible about their ministry was in order to become a member of the body, you had to commit to praying an hour a day. To be a member of the staff, you had to commit to three hours a day of prayer. Wow. That is radical to the Western mind, but especially especially the Western American mind, where prayer, if uh, there was some kind of, and uh, this is uh, Pastor Allen uh, talked about this in his uh, one of his first series, and I and I've told him several times, I was like, you need to re-release the first edition. He thinks the second edition of this thing of this teaching was better. I said, I told him, I listen, I've listened to both of them more than five times, but the first edition I've listened to 10 times, it's, it's called teach my hands to war. And it's about prayer. And he talks about in the statistics that they sent, they pulled, um, you know, Protestant preachers across the United States. And they asked them what's the 10 most, uh, things that were lacking or 10 most important things. Oh, it was evangelism. It was this, it was outreach. It was blah, blah, blah. Prayer wasn't in any of the top 10. So just showed you how uh, how how messed up our, our priorities are. We had a couple of questions I wanted to make sure uh, I asked them before we got too far in the comments. Chris Cap Chris says, is the discernment of the congregation 
of any church choking the truth out of this world's belief of the way, the truth, and the life of believers. Uh, of the way, the truth, of, and the life of believers. Is the discernment of mm. the congregation of any church choking the truth out of this world's belief of the way, the truth, and the life of believers. I'm not really sure what he means by that. Um, yeah, maybe, can you rephrase that, Caps? Because when I read that out loud, I'm like, I don't know what you mean. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll rephrase it, hit, hit us in the comments. Uh, Flame from your channel said, uh, Hey, Rod, is there a mainstream word of faith view that you don't fully agree with? And I have one that I actually want to do a separate episode on, but I want to let you answer first. Yeah, I don't want to start up any controversy here. There are secondary issues, but uh, I do not hold to the to the prevailing view on, on tithing. Uh, I do believe in giving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Given it shall be given, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. I believe in all that. But the way that people teach tithing based on Malachi, that if you don't tithe, you're robbing God. And if you do tithe, you're going to be rolling in dough. I think that that's a misapplication of Old Testament tithing. Because what Malachi was talking about was... Um, bringing a tenth of your crops and every tenth animal into the storehouse to provide for the Levitical priesthood. Mm -hmm. And the Levitical priesthood went away with the temple when it was destroyed in 70 AD. But really, for all practical purposes, it ended for us when the curtain was rent in twain and uh, the new covenant began. Yeah. That's, that's my view. I don't... But I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't necessarily call that a um, a word of faith uh, doctrine or, or belief. Uh, I think because there's a lot of um, outside of the charismatic church that 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 preach and believe tithing. But what's something specifically yeah. in the word of faith that is My, mainstream or just widely accepted that you look at and be like, eh, nah, I don't know about that. That you even partially disagree that, with. Just to, just to add. My grandpa in the Baptist church, he tithed. You know, he was a big believer in tithing. He said, I've always tithed and the Lord's always taking care of me. So uh, that didn't start with word of faith. Anyway, yeah. Uh, my view on the atonement is different from the prevailing word of faith view that Jesus descended into hell and, and suffered in hell as part of the process of atonement. I, I don't. I don't see that in Scripture. I believe that the uh, the sufferings of Jesus were on the cross. And then, before he gave up the ghost, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So, um, you know, it, it's just a different theory on the process. It's not a different theory on the efficacy of the atonement. I believe that the atonement is available to anybody who believes. Yeah. Where some people would say it only applies to the chosen from the foundation of the world. So, but the way that E.W. Kenyon taught it and Brother Hagen taught it, I don't agree with. Um, but like I said, I think that's a secondary issue. And um Brother Hagen was pre-trib on the rapture. Of course, that's not a word of faith view. That's just a dispensational view. Mm -hmm. I disagree. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I used to be pre-trib. I'm not anymore. I'm pan-trib. I've moved away from a solid dispensational pre-trib view. Uh, let's see, the hundredfold return. That's something that's commonly taught in the word of faith movement. Okay, Brother Hagen. Brother Hagen didn't teach that. Well, and, I mean, it doesn't it say? uh 20 60 80 100 or um i think it's 30 60 and 100 30 60 100 yeah that's it uh but that's talking about houses and lands and and family mm -hmm. it's not talking about money he said who you know whoever has left houses and lands and fathers and mothers for my sake in the gospel will receive 30 60 100 fold well wasn't that houses. after wasn't that directly after in one of the gospels after the rich uh the 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 guy wanted to come and be a disciple and he's like well you need to obey the commandments he's like i've done that well you need to do this i've done that too he's like good then sell everything and follow me and he's like 
And he went away sad. Uh-huh. And then they asked him, and he said, you know, well, you know, with God, things, you know, with man, things are impossible. But through, through God, all things are impossible. And then he then he goes into that. I, and I actually was just reading that in Matthew uh, the other day. Um, so I think an argument could be made in the full of con- I, this, I Now I feel like I'm doing a Mike Winger or Alan Parr video. <laughs> well, in the context, if you go back a few chapters. <laughs> yeah, context does have its place. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, the 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 chronology there was the rich young ruler said that he walked away sad and uh jesus said how hard it is for those who trust in riches and he started off saying yes uh how hard it is uh it's easier to for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than heaven and his disciples were astonished and then he said it again and, and when he repeated it he said those who trust in riches yeah and the disciples said, well, who then can be saved? And he said, with men, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And I think at that point, Peter said, behold, we've left everything to follow you. Yeah. And that's when Jesus said, there's none who's left houses and family who will not receive a hundredfold, uh, 30, 60, hundredfold in yeah. this life and in the world come eternal life. Yes. Which, so, which some people conveniently, when they, when they, do a disagreement of that and they're like well he's talking about heaven i'm like are you serious he says right there he says in this life and the next so but so but i think what he's referring to there is when the disciples went out and preached the gospel they would have family they would have a place to stay people opened their homes to them they had family in, uh, among the fellow believers. So you take they more of a and sisters and yeah. Christ. You take more of a reform, like a lot of reform people. That's how they would teach it. Not not many in this camp. Yeah, Kenneth Hagin taught it that way. Oh re- yeah. no, no, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kenneth Hagin, he, Kenneth Hagin said, "I used to teach that about money, and the Lord told me that's not what that means. Read it again." And he read it again, and he said. Oh, he's not talking about money. He's talking about what you leave behind houses, lands, and and family. Look at that. Now that's gonna be a clip. Opus Opus yeah, AI see. is gonna help us make make that a clip. You're gonna be and that's gonna be it's gonna, Kenneth Hagen's true teaching on press prosperity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't teach that you put a hundred dollars in the offering. And plate you get a thousand back. Ten thousand ten thousand. Oh, yeah. ten thousand, yeah. A hundredfold of on a hundred, it would be 10,000. Yeah. Um, but he didn't teach it that way. And uh, he didn't encourage anybody else to teach it that way because it sounds too much like a slot machine, you know, mm-hmm. uh, trying to hit the the three lemons or whatever. <laughs> but uh, ding, ding, the three ding. cherries. Yeah. The three cherries and cherries. I'm sorry. That shows you how much I know. That's uh, Looney Vegas. Tunes. No, I, I get mine from Looney Tunes. I've, I, I've, <laughs> I've been to Vegas so many times and I don't, I'm just like, why are people throwing their money away? This is fun. Uh, yeah. All right. So Ian had a question that says um, to, to both of us, do you think the charismatic tendency to avoid deep theology and apologetics is related to why our churches seem to avoid the woke ideology that is now plaguing reformed denominations? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because charismatics have as long as i've been a charismatic charismatics have a, avoided deep theology and that had long that was long, around long before the woke theology uh it's just an aversion to uh intellectualism and and more of a focus on the spirit yeah i i'd, I'd and, agree with that 100% it's not exciting there's no rush from sitting and reading and sitting and reading and praying and sitting and reading and praying and trying to understand as opposed to, Hey, let's get into church and let's, you know, Hey, I'm going to, Hey, Oh, Oh, everybody. Come on, everybody. Somebody run around the church. You know, this, that's not going to make you sweat and start getting excited and kick off your shoes and take a lap. Like, uh, you know, man, let me go and read what Tertullian thought about this issue. You know, let me go and read about uh, what the early church fathers. Um, yeah. The Apostolic Fathers and the ECF. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Chris re- reworded his thing now. Discernment meaning and including beliefs of each congregation of the interpretation of preaching the word and how it is being applied. 
I don't know. Let me back up and see how he worded it the first time. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to put the two thoughts together. Oh, is that is that why the the truth of God's or believing maybe that is that he means maybe that's what the the truth of God's word or believing God's word is being choked out because of uh, uh, interpretation. You know, everybody's more concerned about their interpretation of preaching the word and how it's being applied. Maybe that's what he means. I don't know. You can definitely choke out the move of the spirit with intellectualism and an overemphasis on theology. At the same time, uh, you can miss what the Bible is teaching by having an overemphasis on uh, spiritual gifts and manifestations. Uh, you know, there's there's an there's a danger to both errors, and a lot of times you will hear people talk about how uh, how any intellectual and and untheological Pentecostals and Charismatics are. Justin Peters has done a whole series on why are Charismatics so weird. But uh, <laughs> well, that's and that's and that's. You know, it, I, I I always find that amusing that they'll say stuff like that. It's like, dude, do you not hang out? And, and they don't. It's because they hang out with only their own. And they and and honestly, believers can be like this. I was having a conversation with Jonathan, which hopefully he never. I don't. I guess he got he got tied up. Um, we were talking about this just just the other day because he and I both work uh, because we've been in full time ministry, and we also work in the secular world. And a lot of people in full time ministry don't interact with unsafe people a lot. They kind of just only hang out with people in the church and church people and churchianity, and they don't venture out. So stuff they 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 can get there. There can be a huge disconnect. Uh, and they can get out of touch. And I think that's interesting that, that, or I always find it amusing when, uh, you know, uh, Justin Peters or what's his name from Wretched Radio, though, it's just weird. And it's like, dude, you only ever hang out with people, you know, you, you hang out with elephants. You know, if you'd actually go out and hang out with a rhino or a lion or a fish, You'd be like, no, it's not weird. It's you don't understand that culture. You know, if you'd go to a different stream of believers, you'd be like, oh, okay, this is just how they word this one thing that we actually all agree on, and they do this. Uh, that that is just always to me. That's I hate to put it this way, but it's the, it's the truth. It's it's it, it's ignorance. It's ignorant. Ignorant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Richard Morris said, uh, considering how many times. Um, Brother Hagen had uh, had personal, intimate conversations with God. Do you think somewhere in there God would have corrected him on his atonement theology? That seems pretty important. Uh, what was his view on the atonement theology, or was that whole, the whole thing about Jesus going into, into hell that you were talking about? Hang on a second. Was that written down? Uh, yeah, it's. But it, I'm I'm seeing comments from three different YouTube channels and from two different uh, Facebook channels. So if you can't see it, it's because it's probably on one of the other channels. That's okay. one thing. That's so, one. Yeah, I'm sorry. that's okay. That's, again, one, then. That, that's one thing I really like about restream is it takes all those comments and puts it in one place. So oh, okay. that, that's a reason I recommended it to you. So we're I'm yeah, trying I'm jumping to... back and forth between browsers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's he said, Richard Morris said, considering how many times, um, uh, and it says Tina Hagen, but that, I'm guessing that was just a, a misspelling. Um, <laughs> uh, he might have been doing like voice to text, but considering how many times Brother Hagen had personal, intimate conversations with God, do you think somewhere in there God would have corrected him on his atonement theology? That seems pretty important. What was his view? Was Did he have a different view of atonement theology? or? Well, his view on the atonement was that uh, Kenneth Hagen also, uh, or the <laughs> Kenneth Hagen's view on the atonement was that Jesus also suffered in hell oh. as part of the process of atonement, not just suffering on the cross. Gotcha. He based that he based that on what Kenyon taught. Now, I think it's just uh, I think it's a misconception of uh, how Kenneth Hagen and other Pentecostals and Charismatics hear from God. 
just because you hear from God about one thing doesn't mean you hear from God about everything. If he wasn't praying yeah. about that, if he just, you know, and we all do this, we all study and come to certain conclusions about certain passages without fasting and praying about it and trying to hear from God to understand how to properly interpret the passage. Uh, so it wasn't a major part of his teaching. It was something he mentioned one time, as far as I know. And uh, it was in his book, The Name of Jesus, in the seminar that that book was based on. Yeah. But somehow or another, Copeland and other people picked up on it and, and just ran with it to extremes. Yeah. And then that all gets blamed on Kenneth Hagin. It wasn't something, he never wrote a book on it. He just mentioned it in one book. So why you would think that that is a major part of his theology that God would correct him on. Uh, if it was a major part of his theology, then I would imagine he would, you know, prayed about it and and, and tried to find some clarity on it. But uh, yeah, I'm surprised that people have made as big a deal as they have out of that, based on the fact that it wasn't taught that much. They're just assuming, I guess, that everything that Copeland and Creflo Dollar and whoever else Benny Hinn, although Benny Hinn isn't word of faith, as I said a hundred times. <laughs> uh, but Copeland especially, and Joyce Meyer. I think Joyce Meyer did this thing where she she said the demons were jumping up and down on Jesus. They were jumping up and down on him. And and that was back in the 90s, and she's moved away from that. She, I don't think she's taught that for over 20 years, but the tape is still out there. People still play the recording of her saying that. But that was when she went through her word of faith uh, phase, and she was teaching all these things. Yeah. And, and she's moved away from that. But she taught it, Benny Hinn, Creflo Dollar. Benny Hinn renounced it. She moved away from it, but Copeland. And uh, well, there's probably one or two others. I think Casey Treat. A lot of people don't even know the name Casey Treat, but he was a Word of Faith guy up in Seattle. But uh, it was taught by several people, several well-known ministers. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't even and, know why why that's called a doctrine because to me it's just it's almost like a little footnote because it it doesn't alter it doesn't alter what what he accomplished one way or the other, you know. Right. Okay, well, we know he went to hell. He got the key, you know, keys from life, you know, uh, from from death and hell. He got the souls from Sheol, or something, you know. But did he suffer? Did he kick? You know. But he punched Satan in the face. I mean, to me, it's just like, okay, you're a, maybe a little just to add. Well, I don't want to say adding to. You're just kind of aggrandizing or uh, what What do they say? Uh, theatric, theatricizing. You know, you're making just a little bit more theatrical. But uh, to me, it's it's never been something like, why in the world is this a topic of debate? There's um, when there's so many other more important things to to really discuss. In my research on this, I, I found a quote from R.C. Sproul on this, and, and he said the details of, about what happened between the crucifixion and the resurrection are very murky, and we shouldn't be dogmatic about any of it. Look and at I that. I agree with that. I, you know, listen, man, this is, this is my heart. Uh, there is so much that we in the Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, reformed, you know, Presbyterian, Baptist, Southern Baptist, there's so much more that we agree on that we don't agree on. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it, um, and do you have, do you have like maybe another 15, 20 minutes? Are you good? Or we got it. We still have about 40 people with us, uh, that are, that are, that are with us. So if, but I don't want to rods an introvert y'all. So this is <laughs> bringing, and we're trying to bring him out and do more live streams. So, but he gets, I <laughs> want, I love watching your live well, streams on your not, channel. He hits he hits fifty minutes. He's like, okay, I'm tired of talking. <laughs> well, it's not it's not that I'm an introvert so much as it is I'm sixty almost sixty seven years old, and when I sit for an hour, I start to kind of stiffen up. A uh, bit. And I need to get up and walk around so that my rear end can gain some feeling. So can can get some blood flow. Yeah. So do, so do you want do you want to call it or do you want to get do you want to no, do you have time for one I more? Keep, I can keep going until I fall out of my chair. Okay, all right. So when he falls out, we know it's not it's not in the spirit. It's physical. It's, so it's no, not no, the no, Holy Ghost. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't Benny Hinn. We're not in Africa. Uh, what's up, Leah Williams? Says introverts are awesome. So well, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. My wife is an is an intro, is an extroverted introvert. She goes to work at a salon and she is very extroverted and then she doesn't want to people anymore. She's like, "Okay, I need 12 to 14 hours mm. of no people." Um I want to touch on like t- I want you to share with us <laughs> some of your interactions because you've actually had interactions with Mike Winger, uh, f- I guess a few with with Justin Peters. I know you've talked to Mike Winger on the phone, and we're not we're not asking for for the gossip or the details, but uh, tell us like some of the interactions you've had with those that oppose. I have opposing opinions and doctrines. Um, mm. And kind of share with us some of those some of those interactions you've had and the challenges and the good, bad, and a little you know the ugly if you want to, and if you want to leave the ugly out of it, you can. Well, Alan Parr one time did a video on Joyce Meyer, and he was really hammering her because of things that she had said uh, on like what I mentioned a minute ago on the atonement, and uh, I uh, I did a video responding to him, and I said that uh you're using quotes that are over 20 years old things that she doesn't even teach anymore and even when she did teach them those are secondary issues she agrees with you on the gospel she agrees on the deity of jesus justification by faith the resurrection and all that so uh i i told him in that video that he needed to uh retract what he had said or something like that anyway he sent me an email and he said i think you have some misconceptions i'd like to talk to you about them and so i answered him and i said okay i'm I'm glad to hear that and then about six months went by and i didn't hear back from him <laughs> and, and i said uh did you decide that you don't want to dialogue and he says oh no i've just been busy i'll get back with you and i said okay the end. Another six months went by. <laughs> so I just said, okay. Um, so that's my interaction with Alan Parr. Um, which is which is still, I mean, like, that's pretty crazy considering the guy is, did he did he finally cross a million subs on, on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's so a million. He's a very good marketer. He approached this whole thing. Uh, I mean, he was serious. When he got into YouTube, he, he was dead set on doing this right from a marketing standpoint he's done a very good job of that yeah. I, you know and, and if that sounds like i'm being snarky you know uh, alan Parr. i mean uh dr uh, alan dio yeah I, I almost just gave him a doctorate <laughs> alan dio is also a very good marketer okay so i have nothing against people who are good at marketing yeah uh, it's a skill i'm not i'm not knocking alan Parr. He's got over a million subscribers, but the thing is, um, it's hard to get his attention if you don't have a hundred thousand subscribers. Yeah, and I don't. I'm, I'm just. Yeah, they don't see time. it as it's. It's uh, unfortunately, it's like, man, this is actually important and should be discussed, but this nobody knows who this guy is. So why am I going to talk to this guy who nobody knows who he is? It's. It's really. Like, that's. Yeah, kind it's, of the way that I took it. Uh, Justin Peters and I have never dialogued. Uh, other than when he leaves comments on my videos. Uh, if, if, I won't say every time, but sometimes when I do a video responding to something that Justin Peters has said, he'll leave a comment. He left one on the, uh, is the Apostle John still alive? When I did that video, he left a comment. Mm-hmm. And I responded to him, and he never responded to my response. Uh, but that's what Justin Peters does. Every once in a while, he pops up and leaves comment on my one of my videos. But we've never interacted beyond that. Uh, so Mike Winger and I actually had a Facebook session a couple of times where we talked. First time, we were talking about the video he did with Melissa Doherty on the Word of Faith. And I said, you know, I think you guys have some misconceptions about the Word of Faith and I've been word of faith for a long time, and I think I'd like to clear some things up. And he actually told me I haven't studied word of faith that much. I was just there to answer Melissa's questions. She invited him onto her channel, so she'd ask him about these word of faith proof texts that were verses she'd heard in the New Age movement. Yeah. And so he came on and answered her questions, 
And one of those was that it's a core teaching in the word of faith that we are little gods. Which, you know, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland has taught that. Benny Hinn taught it and then re renounced it. Uh, and others have taught it, but Kenneth Hagin never said we're little gods. I never heard. I mean, I went to Kenneth Hagin school. We were never taught that. It's something that Copeland started in the late 80s. And it lasted for about 15 years, and I don't hear anybody teach that anymore. It's just an extremist view on the Imago Day. But anyway, that's what Melissa Doherty said, and she was going over the verses, and Mike Winger was explaining what those verses really mean, that kind of thing. So we had a discussion about that, and that one went okay. He, he just said, well, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really done a lot of study on what a faith movement. I was just there to answer questions. The second time I talked with Winger was when I was getting ready to do my response to what he had said about the Passion Translation. Mm. And uh, because I had followed up on some things that he said, and I was going to rebut him, and I said, I want, you know, since you and I have talked in the past, I wanted to give you a chance. Yeah, to... give an opportunity to, before I do this. Right. I was just trying to be cordial. And basically... Uh, his attitude was, uh, well, he just kind of deluged me with all kinds of scholarly stuff about what different people have said about the Passion Translation and the translation process. And that wasn't what I wanted to discuss. You know, I, I'm not saying it's a good translation. And I'm not telling you what my philosophy is on translation. I'm not a linguist. Yeah, but there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, mistruths about that. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy. Um, Brian Simmons. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that that people said that got parroted and repeated because you know one person said it, and then a hundred other YouTubers repeated it because this one right. person with some clout said it, and I think that was the thing that you were addressing. There was several straight up lies about him and his ministry that people were repeating that nobody ever bothered to even investigate to see if it was true or not. Yeah, like an angel helped him. Uh, an angel gave him the translation. I think that's. That's one of the things that uh, he never said an angel gave him the translation. People are trying to make this into a Joseph Smith thing. The angel Moroni yeah. gave Joseph Smith the, the um, what do you call it, the Book of Mormon, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. The Golden Tablets. Oh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so Brian Simmons said, no, I named the translation after the angel of passion. He said, I saw an angel one time in a church service and I asked the Lord who he was. And he said, that's the angel of passion. And so that was the end of that. He, he didn't say he talked with the angel or anything like that. And then when he started doing the translation, he named it after the angel that he saw and he called it the passion translation. Mm. But somehow or another, an angel gave him this translation, which it's silly because if an angel just gave him the translation, it wouldn't have taken him 12 years of translating it a few verses at a time. Yeah. Another thing was uh, that he lied about his chronology. He said that uh, it was a thrill to hand the Payakuna natives of Panama a completed version of the Bible in their own language. And when you got to looking at the timeline, he says, well, he left Panama years before that was completed but he was saying that he handed them a completed copy he's lying but he did when he came back to dedicate a church right well i asked brian simmons about that i said you know how do you explain the, the timeline discrepancy i said what year did you leave he said 88 and i said but it wasn't completed until 95 and he says yeah I said, how do you explain that? You said you were there when you handed them a, a completed copy. He said, we went back for the ceremony. Mm. And I said, well, oh, <laughs> that sounds plausible. And I found out since then that that's a very common thing for missionaries to do because translations usually take 10 to 15 years. Yeah. You don't do it in a year or two. Not and at the all. Average stay, the average stay on the mission field is less than 10 years. So if you're part of a translation process, you're probably not going to be there for the duration. So it's a very common thing for missionaries who have ministered to people on the mission field for years, but they're not there when it's completed. It's very common for them to go back for the ceremony because they were part of that team. They were part of that effort and they want to be there. 
Yeah. And so that was his explanation. He went back for the ceremony, which you know, I don't have any documentation that he did. I don't have any. But it's you know, not with it's not out of the realm of reason. It's not like, hey, man, I went to the moon and then I but I left my watch. And so I went to NASA and said, I got to go back to the moon. Well, the Earth is flat. So you didn't go to the moon in the first place. Ha ha. <laughs> my dog ate my homework. Yeah. Yeah. I have to I have okay. to I have to say something that, that Ian said in the comments uh, a little while ago that you you'll really appreciate. He said uh he said, Par is a great YouTuber and a poor exegete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been meaning to, to do an episode on his thing about praise and worship with uh, with one of my best friends because I, I was like, oh, man, I agree with like 25% of this. And then the rest of it, I was like, I always think like, listen, man, you cannot. Oh, we shouldn't be so repetitive. I'm like bro go read a psalm go look at what the angels are crying in heaven that's a poor argument mm -hmm. i i agree it shouldn't be you know just dumb repetition or as like the lord says vain repetition but uh uh saint question said um she's super grateful for walter martin he taught a lot of good stuff but uh uh yeah it, and also said he said winger doesn't didn't realize someone could go back to a place they left <laughs> but um Flame had a great question, uh, and, or actually, did was was that all the interactions you've had so far that that you wanted to share? Um, so we, we you hit par. Um, have you have you have you had any interactions with what's her face, the girl that came out of uh, New Age and when, Melissa Doherty? Yeah, no, no. I heard through the grapevine that she thinks I'm mean. Well, so. I mean, I I don't understand how the. I mean, I don't know. I, I look I I, some some of those people. I look sideways. I'm like, you know, I, I look at them and I and I go back and I read Matthew seven and I'm like, you know, I, I I'm not being I, I, not to be judgmental because I I have been concerned with this with my own life. But you go from not being saved, not knowing anything about the word, and then all of a sudden you have a platform of several hundred thousand people. And you're calling out and you're having all these, you know, discussions about theology and doctrine. I'm like, well, where have you studied? Where have you, you, you know, and I always find it funny when people come in the comments of, of stuff here on Soul Vitamins and call out stuff we're talking about. And I'm like, dude, Jonathan and I, between the two of us, have been studying this for over 60 years and mm -hmm. walking and living this out. And people are like, this guy doesn't know anything. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. I'm like, oh, really? And what Bible school did you go to? How long have you been serving in ministry? Does that make me qualified? Mm, maybe, but it certainly makes me qualified than just some random uh, schmuck on the internet. Uh, but yeah, that that's my, that's I've always had that issue with her that she's comes off as so haughty and talking down to people. I'm like, sis, you just walked in the door five minutes ago. What in the world are you talking about? Why are you out here it's, trying to, you know, you're trying to correct people that have been living this, you know, I, I, she says stuff that completely contradicts people like Kenneth Hagan or Lester Summerall. And then you, you, and if you know Lester Summerall's testimony, I'm like, you know, I'm going to believe that guy more than somebody that just got out of new age and has just been sitting in front of their computer for their life over, mm. the, you know, I'm not going to believe you over the guy that went and gave his life on the mission field and has true testimonies of faith. I mean, come on, man. Mm. I'm, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's too much of me in my flesh. Cause you know, God can use anybody. He could speak through a donkey. There's one other group that I've had some contact with and that's the remnant radio guys. Really? Yeah. Cause I was a big supporter of their channel at first because they're charismatic. And I thought, well, it's nice to hear charismatics doing theology, but I didn't know that they were reformed. And I eventually found that out, and then they did a video on the Word of Faith movement where they totally misrepresented it. And at that point, I unsubscribed, and mm. I, don't I don't watch their stuff anymore. But uh, Josh and I, Josh Lewis and I, have actually talked on the phone a couple of times. He called me once because he had some questions about Kenneth Copeland. And before they did this program, he wanted to run a few things by me to, to get my feedback on it. So I thought we had a good relationship you know where we could um uh, you know have a conversation <laughs> yeah i thought that was the kind of relationship we had but it wasn't and uh so um and he's repeated th things that mike winger said about 
the Passion Translation that Brian Simmons said he was going to add a chapter to the book of John, and he never said that. Mm. So um, this is all a part of what I call the Cool Kids Club. You know, it's these yeah. evangelical YouTubers who all seem to repeat each other's talking points. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to build my own network of people who, you know, we may not be as good at marketing and everything, but uh, we're, I think, hopefully more committed to fact checking and putting out factual information. Yeah. You know, when, when a story breaks, like with everything that was happening with IHOP, you were like, let's wait. And then when stuff mm-hmm. came out where the, where the, where the women that were, uh, they were saying that they were recanting their, you know, they, I, I never said that he did anything. You said, Hey, let's mm-hmm. wait. And then he mm-hmm. comes out and be like, yeah, I did it. And you said, see, this is why we wait. <laughs> I thought, man, I was like, yeah, I was like, I felt, I, I, I watched that video when, when you did that last video after he came out and admitted it. And I said, yeah, this should be the one that gets a million views or a hundred thousand views. And it won't because people don't care about the facts. They don't care about the truth. They just want, Oh, hot off the press gossip. <laughs> this preacher did something bad. Mm-hmm. Let's all, let's all dogpile and talk about how horrible he is and get some views and then move on to the next topic. You know? Yeah. I do think that there were people uh, discussing that, that were, sincere uh that you know they were a part of that world and like joel joel robinson joel robinson i, I think his name is joel mm-hmm. uh he's got a pretty big following on on social media and he was he was adamant right from the start that these allegations were true and he said i'd stake my ministry on it i didn't know who the guy was or anything but you know he knew all these people and and he really looked up to Mike Bickle, but and he was just devastated when he started talking to these people firsthand. So I don't question his motivation, but there were there were people out there who were totally disconnected from the whole thing that were weighing in on it. Gotcha. And uh, I tried. I did. I think three videos on it. That's but... all you did. That's all you did. Three three videos, and I think a live stream where it was a part of the discussion, but only three right. actual videos just dealing with that subject. I don't like feeling, you know, like I'm, you know, jumping on the bandwagon for views or or things like that. I I wanted to take that as a make that a teaching moment to where you'll learn to wait. And let the facts come in. That's, I think, the best way to handle these things because they have a way of, you know, eventually, the, the truth has a way of eventually coming out one way or the other. And except there in was the case obvious... of JFK's assassination, <laughs> I may do a video on that sometime. Oh, buddy, please let me be a part of because it because you'll, you'll be see, the balanced view up... and I'll be the crazy conspiracy person <laughs> i grew up 150 miles from dallas oh that's right that's right yeah i think i've told you before yes. that i went to school with oswald's niece and so i've always had an interest in that story and uh, wait a is... minute you're friends with oswald's niece i we grew up together oh yeah. wait a minute were you involved rod are you were you i did, didn't did you go to I school didn't... for the cia <laughs> I, I was six years old <laughs> And I was sitting in my first grade class, and the principal announced over the PA system, there's been an assassination attempt in Dallas. And I'm six years old, and I'm like, what does assassination mean? And she says, it means somebody tried to shoot the president. I said, hey, you know, my mom and dad didn't like him anyway. And she said, that's a terrible thing to say, Rodney. <clears throat> uh, I didn't know, six years old. and uh, But as I got older, uh, now they moved. Uh, from the Dallas area to my hometown oh, oh, of Wichita sh- Falls. Yeah, I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, were their last names Oswald? Yeah, he didn't change his name. He cha- no He kept kidding. his last name Oswald, but his company transferred him to Wichita Falls. And he always claimed that it was just business related. It had nothing to do with the assassination. Uh, he was a sales director for, uh, I think, a brick company, something like that. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I, I knew her not well, but I did grow up with uh oswald's niece and uh i just always thought you know this is an interesting story because all of these people died within a few years of the assassination that were part of the investigation oh yes yeah 
and all these people seem to have connections to New Orleans. Why? And I mean, this is stuff I heard back around 1970. This is not something that I got from the Oliver Stone movie. Yeah. And when the, when the movie Executive Action came out in 1973, I went and saw it. I was 16 years old. And I wanted to see that movie. It was about the JFK assassination. It was a kind of a, a conspiracy theory movie that turns out not to be so far off of what I think happened. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I've I've I haven't read a lot of books, but I've I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube since YouTube became a thing. I've watched a lot of videos. I've seen interviews on TV with. Uh, uh, Dr. Baden, Baden, whatever his name is. Uh, no, no, Cyril Wecht. Baden's the other one. Cyril yeah. Wecht is this world famous forensic pathologist. And he says, uh, that, uh, the wounds were from two different bullets. Yep. And he says, if you've got two bullets, you've got two shooters. And if you've got two shooters, you've got a conspiracy. And he says, that's all my expertise can tell you. And that's enough. To, that's enough to blow the whole thing out of the. Yeah, I think we're you, me, and, and Ian and Jonathan are going to have to do a politics thing, and we're going to have to discuss that. Uh, I have to. Yeah. I got. I got to bring up this this one person. And then I have one last question that should be short, and then I'll let you go because I know you're getting sore. Uh, this person, energetic, that has never uh, ever been on here for any of our channels, said, uh, "Sorry, but I have to rebuke you in Jesus's name." The title assumes no charismatic study of theology, theology or apologetics. Obviously, they didn't watch anything. They said they just got in here. How disrespectful. If you're seeing this, why? I saw the title join. Now I'm out. Sad. So you came in for two seconds and said, this is garbage, and I'm rebuking you in Jesus' name and without even watching. This is a pure – this is a this is a perfect example of the problem with people today is they are making judgments without any investigation. That's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, drive-by rebuking, 100%, Ian. Uh <laughs> Any any comments on that before I ask you this last short question? Well, I just went and read the title. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it was a little clickbaity. Oh, but uh, well, you know, I mean well, you know what I'm actually trying to do? I'm trying to do like we learned at the armed conference post put, put the titles to where they ask they ask ask or answer questions. And people right. ask that they they go into YouTube and they put why don't apologize you know they assume they you know that's actually perfect that this person assumed that charismatics and you know don't don't study theology and a lot of reformed people believe that and obviously yeah. they they do uh, they just didn't want it to watch longer than two minutes to actually ask hey do you are you this is what you guys saying hilarious I will I will say that in general charismatics don't study theology as much as Calvinist and reformed people. That's a fact. That is a straight. That is a straight fact, and is and that's a problem. That's why you're but doing at what you do. At the same time, that title was a little tongue in cheek. Yeah, uh, because obviously you and I are sitting here and discussing discussing theology. theology. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the uh, the question flame had a great question, and it was, oh my gosh, I went right by right by it. Uh, if there was, oh my gosh, it's way up there. Okay. If, um, so I, I thought this was cool and I think this is a great place to add this because you know, so many different ministers of the faith, probably going back to the early church until today, but especially concerning the, the charismatic movement. Is there any minister whose life story you think could make a great movie? And I think we should do a whole live stream on this, a whole other live stream. Hmm. A minister whose life would make a great movie. Yeah. I think you'd have I to I think you'd have to pick a couple from the different eras because there's several in the early church. I mean like the, the a couple that that come to mind like immediately for me are like Wy John Wycliffe who was burned at the stake for translating the mm -hmm. Bible. Uh Lester Sumrall, I think has had some um, incredible testimonies and stories and things that he's experienced. Yeah. Um uh, Ian Brown says Oral Roberts. So who who's a minister or or a couple? Name me a couple you think would whose life would make a great movie. 
Well, I like what you said, Lester Sumrall. I think he had a fantastic story about, you know, being on the mission field when he was a teenager. Uh, I mean, he was traveling all around the world in the 1930s. And uh, he he ended you know who Howard Carter was, right? Mm, I am okay. vaguely familiar, familiar with the name. Howard, Howard Carter was one of his mentor, when mentors. Before Smith Wigglesworth, it was Howard Carter. Oh, he was Howard the one that Carter, he was in he was in Asia with when he did the whole thing about going to Tibet, right? The older minister in the it, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I know who that is. He was the one that he told him. He said when uh, when you get a tithe, when you get your offering. You don't. We don't tell each other what it is. It's for you. It's between you and the Lord. And mm-hmm. and uh, he got he got that big um, gift when the, when the the communist uh, general's wife was healed of cancer, and they gave him the money that he went to Tibet, he went to China, he went to Russia, he went like to I think fifteen yeah, countries. He, Lester Sumrall went to Australia to to meet with Howard Carter, and he didn't know where he was. He just knew he was in Australia. That's right. He, That's right. And uh, he went to a certain city. I think it was Melbourne. I'm not really sure. And he just went to uh, an Assembly of God church there because Howard Carter was Assembly of God. And he says, do you know who Howard Carter is? And he said, yes. And uh, he said, "Uh, I'm looking for him. Can you tell me where he is? And he said, well, he's he's in town somewhere. Why don't you go and try over at this church? And he went over to this other church. And uh, the guy knew Howard Carter and and uh, said, that, well, if you just stay here, you know, he's going to be having a service tonight or something like that. Um, he, all he knew was that he was in Australia. He, I don't think he knew what city and I don't think he knew what dates specifically. You know, he just he got the 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 dates and the information all mixed up. But somehow or another, halfway around the world, he found the guy he was looking for. Without that's phones, incredible. that's without incredible. Internet, nothing. Uh, yeah, that's pretty incredible. But, but even more incredible is when he met Howard Carter in Arkansas. Uh, he heard him preach in this church in Hot Springs, Arkansas, I think. And he went up to him after the message and he says, uh, Brother Carter, uh, my name is Lester Sumrall. I feel like God wants me to work with you. Wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'll do. I'll be your partner and and helper throughout to the ends of the earth or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Howard Carter pulled a little note out of his billfold and unfolded it and read it back to Lester Sumrall. And it was the exact words that he had just said to him. What? Wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'll do. I'll be your partner and your helper to the end. It was something like it was the Ruth, the Ruth commitment, the Ruth covenant, something like that. And uh, yeah, maybe that's what it was. I don't know. But anyway, he had it written down, and Lester Sumrall had said it exactly the way that the Lord had told Howard Carter. He says, "I'm sending you a helper, and this is what he'll say when he meets you." And so he read it to him. He says, "You're the one." That the Lord told me about, and uh, He said, "Let's get together. I'm I'm going to Australia. Uh, we'll get together in Australia." <laughs> and then He lost touch with him, and then reconnected with him later on. But yeah, Lester Sumrall had an incredible, incredible story. Um, I think Kenneth Hagen's story is is pretty amazing, but it's I don't think a lot of people. He uh, he's more controversial than Lester Sumrall, so a lot of people probably wouldn't be interested. In watching a movie about his story because there's so much doctrine involved. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people that are lesser known uh, have incredible stories like my my old Assembly of God pastor. He had incredible things happen in his ministry. Uh, he said that he started off as an evangelist and he's driving down the road one night going back to Dallas after uh, a crusade up in oklahoma or somewhere and it's late at night and he's driving down a two-lane road and he went to sleep at the wheel whoa and he was was a young single guy and uh nobody in the car with him and he went to sleep at the wheel and he heard this boom 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 a fist was pounding on the windshield and he woke up and he saw an 18 wheeler coming right at him because he drifted over into the other lane wow so he he pulled back into his lane and avoided an accident. And he, he said uh, he didn't see anybody, but he heard it was just like a fist. 
banging on the windshield. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a pretty incredible. amazing story. Yeah. And brother, brother Alcorn went to Brazil with David Wilkerson. They had a crusade there and a blind man received his sight. Uh, you know, he, he saw a lot of incredible things happen, but you know, he's not a household name. People yeah. that knew the assemblies of God in Texas, they knew brother Alcorn, but, um, and, and David Wilkerson had a pretty incredible story well, too. They, they, uh, they, they, they kind of made a film about him with the cross and the switchblade. Yeah, but uh, there was a lot more to David Walker than oh, what you saw. In, oh, hundred percent. That's what I'm. That's what I'm getting at. Is yeah, uh, you know his uh, his ministry was global. And I he, think your video, your video was almost a good, um, could almost be turned into a screenplay because you did a, a video of uh, talking about his life and his ministry. That there was things in there. I, I mean, because my mom was in, introduced us to 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 him, and I was. So we knew of him. We knew of a lot of his prophecies, crossing the switchblade, Nikki Cruz. But mm -hmm. some of the stuff you went into, I was like, man, I didn't know that. Man, I didn't he know that. He was a faith healer. I and he I never a, heard that. I didn't. I didn't know about that either till I read his son's book uh, on him. But he was known as Davy Wilkerson, and uh, he used to drive around town and and he had a little TV show where he would uh, pray for the sick and stuff. And he operated in gifts. People got healed. And he prophesied over people. That's people don't know that about David Wilkerson, but he used to do stuff. He started off as a ventriloquist. That's another thing people don't know. Mm. He, you know, when he was a teenager, he would do a, a dummy thing for the children's church. So uh, it's it's hard to imagine David Wilkerson with a man, <laughs> you know, hi there. Yeah, doing doing the Jim Henson. Um, Saint Questions uh, said Bishop C. H. Mason. Are you familiar with that name? Bishop C. H. Mason. I know who Eric Mason is. I don't know C. H. C. H. Mason. Mason apparently was the the one that started the Church of God in Christ. Uh, okay. He's she oh, said she said Eric. he was very controversial, and uh, she said that there's there's not enough about uh, black folks in church history. Um, and I, William I, Seymour would be another great one to. to is that the one from the... Azusa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's so many that you could that you could think of. Uh, Gordon Lindsay, I think, had an incredible life. Oh yeah, Gordon uh, Lindsay. I mean, I think, and then if then once you start talking about musicians, then that's a whole. I mean, a Andre Crouch, I think, should be. That's a story that should be told. Why? Why they're making films about every other great musician and not mm -hmm. somebody? Well, this is this is something that we're lacking in the church. But that sounds. I think that'll just we'll just do a whole live stream on that. Just ministers, or you know, men and women in the faiths. Who's because we're not even talking about women now. We're just talking about men. But there's incredible women in in the faith that should have had should have their stories told in film um I, anyway so we could we could go all night but uh i've we've kept you long enough it's been almost two hours um so i've put brother rod's uh channel in the in the chat a couple times i'm gonna put it one more time before we get out of here so this is Everybody, if you are not already subscribed to Jew and Greek, I encourage you to subscribe. And if you're over there on Jew and Greek and you want to wander over to Soul Vitamins or Gabriel Bello Music, please do so. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be oh. on Rod's channel here soon talking about Lord knows whatever. Go ahead. I was just going to I was just going to say to the subscribers to my channel, I want you to know that we're going to have a lot more uh, interaction between me and, and Gabriel because I, I feel like he's got a calling to do this kind of thing. He's got the gift of gab. He know he knows the technology. Uh he's a great musician and uh he is a solid believer and has a, a great grasp of apologetics. So uh I do intend to be collaborating with him a lot more in the future. So you guys subscribe to his channel too. Thank you. Thank you. And uh and go check out my music. I don't know if, if your music's on Spotify and iTunes and all that other stuff, but you can check out. If you're looking for music that sounds different from what you hear in the church, and if you're tired of church music that only has four chords, trust me, go listen to my album Miracle. Go listen to my album God's Not Through. And uh, I've got smooth jazz out there if you just want to listen to something pleasant that doesn't have lyrics. So, uh, but yeah, Rod, thank you so much. Um, 
yeah, now we got the we, we, we started it with the movie stuff. They're like, you know, yeah, I heard they're making a movie about Carmen. I heard the, the Clark sisters movie was dark. And I was like, yeah, it was about a bunch of drama. And I hope they do make a movie about Carmen. So uh, but we'll do that. Yeah. And, and to let you all know, Rod and I have been talking, like he said, about doing some some of these together more often. And I'm hoping to do one a month as we are in an election year. And I'll end with this. This year, not only is a big election year for the United States, but apparently there's, uh, I can't remember, it's more than eight, it's something something ridiculous. 60 countries worldwide, there's about half the world's population, 3.8 billion people are having elections this year, or, or almost 4 billion people's lives will be affected by elections this year. So Rod and Jonathan, my partner here on Soul Vitamins, are political geniuses. Uh, and I'm kind of just a common Christian man that's uh, just got into, into politics in the last five years and started paying attention. Uh, so I, I talked to Rod about just getting together once a month to kind of discuss current events concerning because there's not enough balanced conversation. It's basically, well, if you're not for Trump, you're not for Jesus. And it's like, well, if you vote for Trump, you're the devil. And, uh, you know, these guys actually know how to have a conversation without demonizing people, uh, intelligent conversations that everybody will benefit from. So we're hoping to get that going here, as uh, especially with what happened with this, with this week in Iowa and Vivek Ramaswamy dropping out. So uh, hopefully we will see all of us together here more often and we can come together, reason, discuss, and pray and uh, uh i'm gonna i'm gonna give rod the last few words and then rod i'm gonna just ask you to pray over all of us before we get out of here amen okay, amen well, saint Qua questions no more four chords more than four chords in jesus name man gabriel has a song about that go check it out jesus, jesus deserves jesus. more than four chords more than four chords uh, all i'll say in closing is that uh we all need to be prepared to give an answer to people who ask us questions about what we believe and why we believe. And uh, that's what I want to be. Uh, I, I want to equip people to give answers, not just about charismatic stuff, but about uh, why we believe the Bible, why we believe in Jesus as the only way to salvation, why we believe in God, creationism, that kind of, there's just so many different areas of apologetics to cover uh but i think it's uh it's time that we grow up in the charismatic movement and uh equip ourselves to deal with these issues in the intellectual arena and uh and gabriel and i have had a lot of discussions along these lines over the past couple of years and uh he doesn't get into it a whole lot but this guy is he studied a lot of philosophy and apologetics and and he can converse along these lines, even though he's a saxophone player. <laughs> <laughs> that was <Yeah>. odd. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, people don't usually uh, link saxophone players with theology, but you know how how much do you link guitar players with theology, for that matter? <laughs> a, a lot of great ministers have a background in music, starting you know, with Mike, David, baby. Mike Winger was a uh, uh, plays guitar and, and has led worship. Alan Parr, Alan Parr plays keyboard and and has done worship. Uh, Elisa Childers used to be part of uh, Zoe Girl. Yep, her dad was Chuck Gerard, who was part of the whole Jesus Revolution yep. group Love Song. So you'll find a lot of people with a musical background, and and I think that that's that's not unusual because that's two things that you get in church is music and theology. So uh, anyway, but yeah, thanks for joining us here tonight, and uh, let's go ahead and and close it in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for all of these people who have tuned in to uh, share in the study of the Word and who have a heart for the things of God. And I pray your blessings on Gabriel and his channel as we move forward. Give us witty inventions and ideas mm. to take the Word of God to the world in this generation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Jesus loves you, and so do we. Take care. <laughs>